What can I say? More <laughs> of that later. On the show tonight, we find out more about low band receiving antennas with Frank W3LPL. We look back at Radioactive with NFD and six meter stations from last weekend. And as you may have seen, a special guest. Mm. And we find out what on earth this is. But we do kick off with news of uh, club news indeed. And uh, of course, what was a very busy weekend for many of you who came to see us at Radioactive just a couple of days ago last weekend. We think around about 80 people, different people at different times came over a whole weekend, literally from the early the Saturday morning right through to the Sunday, sometimes overnight operating one of the two stations and everything. Um, and lots of you have sent us pictures and videos. So I think, as they say, a picture's worth a thousand word words. So Tammy, why not roll VT?
happy memories from uh, those of you who made it over the weekend and maybe bits you didn't see. And uh, for those of you who didn't make it, well, hopefully you'll make it again. I hope we'll go and do this again someday as well. So thanks again to everybody. I don't want to mention any names, but there were an awful lot of names. And some people who worked very hard on, on very specific things. But if I mention them, I'm, I'm in danger of missing somebody. I don't want to do that. So just thanks to all of you, however you got involved, whether you just ate our food, <laughs> good luck, um, whether you bought a raffle ticket, whether you contributed, whether you wrote a presentation, all those things needed to be done. You worked so hard on the both those, the six metre SSB station and the CW station. Whatever you did, it contributed to a great weekend. And it was really, for me, I think the most emotional thing was just seeing everybody back together and seeing, you know, lunchtime, I think we served 70 or 80 roast rolls and things. And to see sort of 50, 60 people there on Sunday was great. So uh, well done and thank you to all of you. And of course the weather, which was actually the warmest weekend we've definitely had this year. <laughs> and suddenly Monday, it's all gone down again. So the tip is, if you want good weather, invite a top weatherman. And if they say they'll come... Do you reckon? Sorted. So thanks again. I must say special thanks as well to those uh, sponsors who gave us some wonderful raffle prizes. That was BHA Acti BHI sorry, Active Filters, DCP, Gage Master, ICOM UK, JPR Electronics and Martin Inch & Sons. Because we're really thrilled to tell you that we raised over £600 uh, at the weekend for cancer research in the Alzheimer's Society. That's a lot for what is really a, just a club weekend activity. So thank you ever so much indeed for that. Um, we have got one ticket which uh, is unallocated. I don't know whose it was because they didn't write the name or course on the back. And this is the number, 484. And that's actually a thick picture that we've taken of the actual ticket, which was stuck to an item when it was drawn. So please, if you have that ticket, and if you haven't, if you, if you think maybe you didn't write your name on the back, please especially check your raffle tickets because you've won a prize and uh, drop me a nine and let me know. Thank you. Actually, before we go, Tammy, I know we said thanks and everything, but there was a bit of a naughty film we took, wasn't there? There was. <laughs> Should we show that? Um, so when you saw the picture of the opening on the opening credits of Narc Life and the da friend, the Dalek, our special guest, uh, saying everything, he was just finishing it. You might have noticed in the background a car pulling up and that wasn't rehearsed, that just happened. Um, and we rather naughtily kind of hid away and kept the film rolling. And I hope the person forgives us if we show you this little videotape. And if the camera works rubbish, that was me with the camera and I was shaking with mirth so much with laughter. Have a look at this. Well done, Tony, for being such a sport. I'll tell you what, if that was me, I think I'd have been up the stairs because it was the one place the Daleks couldn't go. Although Les uh, Wilson, who, who made that wonderful uh, Dalek, told me that they've now got a way of flying, I think, or something. So that Daleks, you can go. You can't even be safe upstairs or behind the sofa. Anyway, thanks again. We thought we'd show you that little one there. Right, now on to other club news. Now, it won't have escaped your notice that with me mentioning Barford, our annual radio rally, our annual radio event, which is coming up on the Sunday, the 2nd of July. I'm going to mention it all again because it's worth mentioning. Um, we've now sold out of tables inside, but we've got plenty of outdoor pitches. You get pretty much unlimited space for £8, so it's easy there. It's £2.50 to get in, or if you're under 16, it's completely free. 16 or under, youngsters we encourage, and they're completely free. So large outdoor pitches, £8, you, and, um, and there'll be a bring and buy stand. So if you've just got one or two pieces of equipment or something to sell, you can bring them inside the hall and we'll sell them on your behalf. There'll be a repeater group and there'll be a CW stand and there'll be also another charity raffle there for the club's charity. So it's all happening on Sunday the 2nd of July. Tammy, 
Over to you for your little people, Little please. people, yeah. Well, we saw some people using the workshop this weekend. So mm. what do you think the workshop's made of? How do you think you hang up all the things? Oh, Are you is sure it it's board or is it biscuits? I'm going to check the wall because I was hungry earlier. I'm still hungry and maybe I should disappear at the workshop. That's maybe. great, isn't it? Maybe. And what size do you think that is? Because this is the miniature-calendar.com, which we, we use every time we do an arc live from Japan. But I'm just trying to gauge, I think have they made like, miniature tools there? Yeah, but I think it's more like, say, G gauge type of thing, which is, what, one in 40 odd? Something like that, I yeah. Think. It's fantastic where they've made those small tools and everything. Anyway, as I said, miniature-calendar.com, a different picture every day. And Tammy picks one out for us, so thanks very much, Tammy. So what have you been doing? Although it's uh, two weeks since we met, apart from Radioactive, which was a massive event, we haven't actually had any news from you. So before we meet again in another two weeks here on Night Live, don't forget to let us have details of uh, your news, things that are happening in your life, whether they're radio or electronics or, or something else as well. We just love to share them with everybody. You can drop them to this usual email address, radio at dcpmicro.com. Thank you. Now on to that competition. And I'd be lying if I said that this one hadn't had quite a few entries uh, for it. So let's have a look and remind you, we asked you two weeks ago, what on earth is this? And apparently quite a few, few of you think you know. So let's go through them, Tammy. Uh, firstly, Tony M0 TDK says, I think the new mystery object is a pickle fork with which one can extract one's chosen pickle from the depths of the pickle jar and then with a sharp tap on the button, project the said pickle across the dining room table <laughs> to the consternation of polite society. <laughs> you could have just said a pickle fork, but anyway, okay, thank you. Tony? Tony, my name's no, Tammy. No, I mean, sorry, Tammy, <laughs> over to you. You forgot my name. Um, Bob GASTU says, a wild guess, a pickle fork for onions, maybe. Steve G3VA, the object is a pickle onion fork. Mark G0TMT, that's a pickle fork. Tom, G8XQD, your object of interest is a sprung fork pickle grabber ejector. Could it be a pickle picker Peter Piper picked his pickled pepper with? I'm glad you got that one. <laughs> okay, yeah, I never did read that before. Anyway, <laughs> that was Tom, G8XQD. Nev, M0NFY, without knowing the size of this item, I have a few ideas. If it's small, it could be an olive or pickle picker, as in picked out of the jar, not from the tree. If it's large, then maybe a potato or vegetable picker. Either way, fruit or veg is stabbed with the fork tines? Tongs. Tines, yeah. Tines. And then released by pressing the plunger. Mike G.E.Y. says, This one looks like a spring action pickle fork used to extract pickles from a jar or other container and dispense without handling said pickles by pushing the plunger. And definitely COVID compliant, he said. <laughs> the item in this week's this week is a pickle fork used to get pickled onions or gherkins out of the jar, pushing the red button deposits the pickle on your plate. Could do with them, isn't it? your dad, you know. I know, I really want one. They do, they do spread across the table. Well, you've got a birthday coming up in July. I know it's a bit more than I normally spend, but we'll yeah. have a look, all right? Uh, Steve G4GHO, this week's mystery object is a fork for picking pickled pe onions or similar from a jar. The red plunger then ejects from this, the said fork. We had one of the, in the family in the 60s. Well, maybe it's not a thing they have nowadays then. Mm. Although somebody's obviously got one still. Neil G4JUV, telescopic spring pickle fork, stab the gherkin, olive it, etc. Lift from the pickle jar, press the red knob to eject the pickle on your plate. But not everybody thinks it's a pickle fork because David M6DPZ says, my guess is it's a fruit destoner. Mm. You mm. might be able to use it that. for that. I see that, yeah. Bruce G4KZT, I recognise the mystery item, it's a pickle fork. My granny had one, which she used to get the pickled onions and beetroot out of the jar without getting spattered in juice. You stab the item in the jar with the prongs, move to your plate, press the plunger and pickle food is ejected. I haven't seen one for a while, but I wouldn't be surprised to hear you still buy them. Keith M7KKO says it's a pickled onion fork for getting them out of the jar, etc. Richard G0VC... W looks like a pickle fork to me. Nick M0 HGU says it's a pickled onion fork and where do I find one? Been looking for years. <laughs> Neil G4 HUN, it's a pickled onion fork. And Richard Rushma, sorry I don't have your call sign Richard. Uh, your item is a pickle fork. My family had one when I was a child. 
Now, are we going to say What do you they're... think it is, then? Well, I was going to say, are we going to say they're all wrong? It's a it is. pickle fork to pick yeah. up your pickled onions. And you, your family really could do with one, couldn't yeah. they? Yeah. So thank you to David G3 MPM for sending that. If you've got an item like this that you've got around for years and you think you might catch somebody out or lots of people out with what it is, especially you usual gadgets like that, then please don't forget to drop them on a line to us with a picture as well. And we'd love to use them. Anyway, as you say, that's the answer for this that last competition. Let's have a look and see if you know what on earth is this. I'll just go back to the pickle fork for a moment because Steve, G3 EVA, said a pickle fork is still available from Amazon. Okay, and other retailers, I guess. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Do you know what that is yet? Have a look at it. You've got two weeks, just under two weeks. We need to know by three o'clock on Wednesday, it'll be what, the 21st of June, what that is. Have a think, have a look carefully at it. We'll put it onto our Facebook page and we'll put it onto the club website and the newsletter, as always. And you've got and said until three o'clock on Wednesday week to let us know. So just to quickly let you know what's happening this week at NARC. On Sunday at seven o'clock, we've got the GB2RS News on GB3MB. At Monday at 7.30, also on GB3MB, the Monday Night Net. At eight o'clock, the 80 meter CW Net on 3.543 megahertz. And then next Wednesday, the 14th of June, we're meeting at CNS for a social and bright sparks for our younger members as well. And then we meet here again, as I mentioned, for two we in two weeks time, for NARC Live, we've got a talk then on HamPi and other ham applications on single board computers. So ideally, if you, especially if you're in the uh, Raspberry Pi group. But please, as I said, mentioned uh, as I mentioned, please keep sending us your stories, your pictures, all your news. It does help us keep connected. And also, we have this card, which we're very happy to send to anybody who you think may be cheered up. Um, or maybe they're celebrating a, a special birthday or an anniversary or something like that. Just uh, send us their name and address, and we'll add your name to ours and send them the card very soon after we get it. Thank you very much indeed. I've got a bit of news actually, I'm just reading this site reading now, uh, from Sunny M0SYW says, the mention of the May 144 meg contest, uh, the NARC team came runner up in the open con uh, con test, 240 QSOs, 86 malts, the best DX of uh, SM2CW. Anyway, well done to all those teams. I didn't know that those results were confirmed. And of course, we'll also let you know how we did at the, the two contest stations um, from Radioactive once they're confirmed as well, and once those logs have been finished and uploaded as well. So thanks very much for that, Sonny. Now it's time to move on to our main event with thanks to our guests for waiting a little bit longer than usual and hopefully you'll forgive us. It's lovely to welcome back to NARC Live, Frank W3LPL. Hello, Frank. Hello, David. Good to be back. Yeah, great. I, I'm, I'm very, I'm very suspicious of that video. Are you sure that wasn't a shot in the south of France? No, I know it really was like that, and I don't know if you've heard about. I mean, you know, British weather actually by early June normally has got a lot better, um, but it has been really, really cold. And and as I said, from Monday as well, it's quite chilly here. I was. I wore a, a jumper last night as well as a, a shirt and things. So, but it was really beautiful, not a cloud in the sky, but we do have a really good weather expert. You might know um, uh, uh, Jim, G3YLA. You might have heard of him if you're into propagation and uh, weather and things like that. And he, he's a, a well-known weather forecast. And we invited him and he came. So I think that's, that's why we were blessed with good weather. What's the weather like <laughs> when you are? I was expecting to see wellies and horizontal <laughs> rain and rain suits. Well, it would have been a, probably if just a couple of months ago, it would have been. But um, no, we certainly had some good weather. What's the weather like where you are? Uh, the weather is delightful, but there are some big forest fires uh, up in Quebec. And the weather patterns are such that the smoke has driven down this way, hundreds of miles away. And it's very smoky outside. Oh, wow. You're in Maryland, aren't you? I should say, by the way. For, yes. For everybody at yes. Near, okay. near, near uh, Washington, D.C. Yeah. A long way from Quebec, but here we have their smoke. Wow. OK, well, I hope you have a, a safe summer. Um, you're here to talk tonight about low band receiving antennas. 
Yes, that's right, David. And what do you want to do about questions? You want to do that at the end? Or we'll do those. Yeah, we'll do the questions at the end, if that's all right. But as, as if I might mention to everybody now, um, in case this is one of the first NARC lives that you've seen, we welcome you to make comments or ask questions of Frank, and we will read them to him, usually at the end of his talk. But uh, So now I'll hand back to you, Frank, and we look forward to your talk, and we'll, we'll come back for questions later. Okay. Pleased to be back again with uh, NARC and... Uh, Hopefully, uh, some of some of the uh, viewers will be inspired to try some of these antennas. So, what's so hard about low bend uh, operation? Well, just about everything. Um, usually, on 160 meters, which is the focus of this presentation, but it also applies to 80 meters. Uh, or often operating below what would be considered the lowest usable frequency. And as a result, signals are weaker than normal. And uh, there's all kinds of sources of noise, um, both man-made uh, and natural. And it can be quite a challenge. And now, of course, we're very close to solar maximum. That probably will have happened by this time next year. So as a result, uh, not only is propagation not as favorable on the low bands, but a lot of the activity that would normally be on the low bands has now shifted to uh, to the higher bands, so activity has dropped off as well. So why receiving antennas? Well, they offer much better performance than most transmitting antennas on the low bands. They're also much lower cost, much smaller in size. Uh, they provide good directivity, in some cases on a very small piece of land. And uh, on a larger piece of land, like the, the site we saw in the video, it's possible to achieve performance similar to a five element Yagi on about three quarters of an acre. Um, and also at the end of the presentation, I'll show you some of the modern transceivers that allow you to combine two antennas with a uh, variable phase controller to uh, uh, combined two antennas or to use diversity reception uh, with a transceiver such as the Elecraft K3. And I think there are some other transceivers out there today that also have two uh, receivers that are phased locked. So uh, one of the one of the problems with uh, when you have more than one antenna to compare is how what, what sort of a metric do you use for comparing antennas. And one of the most popular uh, was developed by WHAI, and there's a URL for his uh, website down below. And uh, he developed a technique which is built into a, a program called EasyNEC. That program is freeware now. Um, and it, what that program does is it compares the forward gain of an antenna at the desired azimuth and elevation angle compared to the average antenna gain over the entire hemisphere. And the result of that is called RDF. Uh, that's not a perfect uh, measure of antenna performance because it assumes that the noise is evenly distributed across the entire hemisphere. But of course, with the man-made noise especially, often the undesired signal you want to get rid of is focused in a particular place. and. Uh, RDF uh, isn't an, an ideal measure when, uh, when RFI is very focused. Um, it also assumes that the RFI is in the far field of the antenna. And for very large receiving antennas, that distance can be a thousand feet away or more. So uh, it, it might seem counterintuitive, but when the RFI source, a neighbor's TV, for example, or uh, their electronic device computer, when, when they're much closer to your uh, location, a small antenna often provides better performance than a big one. So this slide just uh, uh, characterizes the performance of some popular small receiving antennas. I'll cover many of these in more detail uh, in the presentation. Uh, the, the figures in the left-hand column are those uh, RDF figures, receiver uh, perf receiving performance figures. 
And they vary all the way from a very simple uh, eight foot diameter loop, often referred to as a magnetic loop. And I'll show a photograph later of such an antenna. Uh, in order for those magnetic loops to perform well, it's very important that they be close to the ground. Certainly no higher than six or seven feet above the ground. Uh, otherwise, they become susceptible to horizontally polarized signals for which magnetic loops have very poor directivity. So in order to uh, preserve the performance of a magnetic loop, it's important that they be uh, close to the ground, not necessarily on the ground, but uh, six or seven feet maximum height. Even a uh, omnidirectional single vertical antenna has uh, receive it, receiving directivity because its sensitivity to noise coming directly overhead is significantly reduced. Its primary uh, radiation angle is down closer to the ground. So its RDF is actually 5 dB, even though it's an omnidirectional antenna. And, and we'll talk about all the rest of the antennas uh, here. Uh, these are all small antennas, so you can see uh, the performance of some of these small antennas can be uh, quite good. And we'll talk about that in detail. And of course, you can do a lot better uh, with more land. Uh, but uh, only about 4 dB better uh, than you can with small antennas. So depending uh, on what your requirements are, uh, it may not be necessary to use a really large antenna. Uh, among the very popular larger antennas are beverage antennas typically installed just high enough above the ground to avoid being a trap for human beings or animals. So seven feet high is normally where beverage antennas are installed. I'll show some images of them. Arrays of short vertical antennas are very popular now. Uh, these short verticals are typically uh, about 20 feet tall. And uh, you can get quite good performance on, on those uh, with uh, a, a size of about uh, 80 feet. Um, a lot of hams have plenty of room for that. And of course, if, if space is not a problem at all, then uh, an array of four 1,000-foot-long uh, beverage antennas uh, is a really spectacular antenna, but it takes a very large amount of land. Um, so a, a, a very popular antenna is the uh, bidirectional so-called magnetic loop. It's a very specialized antenna. It's basically an omnidirectional antenna, except that it has very deep nulls off the side. Uh, those nulls for an eight-foot diameter loop are about 24 dB in depth. And it's a very narrow, about two degrees uh, null uh, beam width. So the way you use this sort of an antenna is you use it to uh, suppress a single RFI source. It's, it's, this is not an effective antenna when you've got multiple sources because it'll only null one of them at a time. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, it's important that it be close to the ground to optimize the depth of the null. Now these receiving antennas, uh, all of these small receive antennas have very low signal output. So it's very important uh, that uh, a, a preamplifier be used with all of them. Uh, otherwise, the received signal is uh, too weak. And it may be surprising to some, but because the output signal level from these small loops is so small, you uh, should be using a preamp that not only has good gain, uh, at least 20 dB, and in some cases higher than that, uh, but it all, that also needs to have a very low noise figure uh, because the signal output from these small loops is so small. There's a variety of these antennas that have been described over the years, uh, shown here as the flag pendant U, K9AY, VE3DO. These are all basically different ways to bend wire. Uh, they're basically all the same kind of antenna. They have different shapes. Uh, they share uh, in common a 3 dB beam width that's quite broad, about 120 degrees. But the front to rear ratio can be really, really good. 
and that's where they come in. So unlike this, the uh, magnetic loop, which has very deep, very narrow nulls, the terminated small loop uh, has a very broad beam width off the front and a very good uh, null off of the back. And there are some specialized antennas also uh, uh, that involve a use of a rotator, and I'll show a photograph of one of those. Uh, but also uh, a magnetic loop, small loop can be rotated. Not apparent to me why you'd want to use that because its purpose of life is to null a single source, and usually you can you can uh, rotate it manually to null out that single source of RFI, and then it's omnidirectional in all the other directions. So it'd be very rare to put a rotator on a magnetic loop. So this idea of receiving antennas is not exactly a new idea. Um, Transatlantic radio uh, was born uh, during the years preceding World War I. And uh, during the war, uh, when America joined the war in 1917, it became especially important for us on the North American side to have reliable communication uh, with our European allies. And there was a very great deal of concern that the telegraph cables that were available at the time might be cut by German submarines. And in fact, uh, there was a, several German submarines that were known to be equipped to cut uh, cables. And one of them visited the shore of uh, New York, New Jersey, um, and uh, cut some cables. Fortunately, they cut the wrong cables. They cut cables running from uh, New York to the Caribbean, and that wasn't of very much importance to the conduct of World War I. They uh, failed to cut the telegraph, any of the telegraph cables running from the east coast of the United States to uh, Great Britain. But the capability was there. So that was the reason for a very serious effort uh, during the war to make uh, transatlantic radio, com radio communication much more important. And the reason that reliability was a problem was what was referred to at the time as static, or the static interference problem. And this is an image that was on the cover of Wireless Age magazine, which was a magazine published by the Marconi Company in London. And this shows a, a receiving antenna. Um, it's, it was uh, thousands of feet long and uh, maybe 20 feet high. And it was a, a pair of phased loop antennas. But the frequency used at that time was down around 50 or 100 kilohertz. Of course, they called it kilocycles at the time. And uh, wavelengths are huge. So uh, antennas that seemed to be physically very, very large in terms of wavelengths were actually very, very small. Um, this is the, uh, the uh, schematic diagram of that antenna that was shown on the cover of Wireless Age magazine. And you can see uh, schematically uh, the actual antenna that was built was 400 feet high, two loops, 400 feet high, 1,000 feet long, and separated by a distance of about a mile and uh, various components in here to phase those loops to uh, create a null in the undesired direction. So let's look at more practical stuff from a 21st century point of view. Um, these small loops that I discussed can also be phased, but of course, uh, in, in order to get useful performance uh, out, out of them, uh, uh, it winds up taking somewhat more land. Uh, I'll show an image a little bit later of uh, an electrically switchable uh, pair of uh, compact small loops. Um, these are not actually uh, phased loops. It's a matter of just uh, selecting one or, or the other, but it's very popular and provides about 8 dB of RDF, which is a few dB better than an omnidirectional antenna. Its main benefit being its front to back ratio. And also these small loops can be operated broadside, but it takes a lot of land to do this. 
350 feet of broad spot, broadside spacing on 160 meters. By the way, um, in this presentation, when I talk about dimensions, they were always in terms of a, a 160 meter bin. So uh, to uh, determine the dimensions for the 80 meter bin is just a matter of dividing the, the numbers I'll mention by two. And I, and I won't attempt to convert all of these dimensions to 80 meters, it's just a matter of dividing by two. And uh, you can put mechanical rotators uh, on some of these arrays and I'll, and I'll show some photographs of what's been done. But unfortunately, when you uh, phase two of these small loops in an end fire configuration to get uh, really good, a really, really good RFI suppression, it has the unfortunate effect of also uh, reducing the received signal strength of the desired signal. And uh, these uh, end fire phase loops require at least 40 dB of preamplification uh, and a noise figure of better than 2 dB in order to get the uh, performance out, out of the uh, antenna that it's capable of producing. And the other uh, extreme problem when you have an antenna producing such very, very low signal levels is that you want to be sure that the signals you're receiving are actually coming off of the antenna and not various uh, stray signals that are being picked up off the uh, outside of the shield of the coaxial cable. So uh, for these kind of antennas, it's common for end fire close based loops to bury the feed lines uh, out to the antenna and then uh, put a lot of uh, ferrites on the outside of the coax cable to make sure the signals do not enter the uh, uh, transmission line from the outside of the coax. Um, so for, uh, for all of these small antennas, one of their great advantages is when the RFI source is very close. Uh, they're, they're particularly effective for that. Um, there's an antenna that's fairly popular. It's called a beverage on ground or BOG. Uh, these, are, these are quite effective antennas, but their low angle sensitivity suffers from their proximity to the ground. Um, but if it's the only thing you can do, then uh, it's still a quite a useful antenna. However, uh, this term beverage on ground is misleading. If, if the wire uh, for this uh, antenna, and it's, it's typically about 220 feet of wire, if it is literally laying directly on the surface of the ground, its performance is severely compromised. But if you just raise it a few inches above the surface of the ground, in other words, if it's just sitting on top of grass, its performance is quite useful. So uh, for the hams who use these things, it's uh, very beneficial uh, to occasionally go out into the uh, field where the antenna is located and just raise it above the surface of the ground so that it's no longer sitting on, uh, directly on the surface of the earth. And the difference in performance is spectacular just by raising the antenna a couple of inches. And uh, these beverages over ground can be switched, so they can be uh, either they can be either bidirectional if there's no termination on the at the end of the wire, or if there's a resistor at the end, uh, it will be directional. Or you can uh, arrange it so you can switch the antenna, uh, let's say either left or right, or if you use directions, let's say either northeast or southwest. And it's also possible to wide space these antennas using broadside phasing, but you need a lot of space, 350 feet. So the, the main use of these bog antennas is uh, when uh, the antennas, not to make, not to make them uh, highly visible. So hams use these maybe when they're uh, clandestinely using an, an adjacent piece of property without uh, uh, drawing attention uh, to the antenna or or when there's uh, reasons for uh, needing to hide the antenna because of restrictions on your own property or whatever. Um, 
So let's look at beverage antennas that are more conventional. Uh, normally they're seven feet high, uh, but only about seven feet high because they suffer a similar problem to the small magnetic loop. And that is if, if you raise them very high, they start to receive horizontally polarized signals and that degrades the performance of the antenna. So I won't read these one by one, but uh, depending on the length of the antenna for 160 meters, about the shortest length that provides useful, useful performance is 250 feet. A very, very commonly used lengths is about 500 to 600 feet. And only a few hams uh, uh, extend the length of the beverage beyond that, but lengths up to about a thousand feet are still quite useful. And they can also be phased uh what's called a staggered array a staggered array of beverages and i'll show that uh, in the schematic in a little bit and they can also be phased in a broadside configuration and i'll show off an image of that a little in a little bit so these beverage antennas are not new they were developed uh during world war one uh to help solve this uh, static problem as they called it back in those days uh, but they were forgotten by hams for almost 50 years until uh, K1PBW, a very uh, enthusiastic 160 meter operator, reintroduced them uh, uh, during the late 1960s. This is a, an image, pardon the grainy image, but it's the best one I've ever been able to find. But this is a 1300 foot beverage antenna that was installed by a, an American radio amateur in Ardrossan, Scotland, near the waterfront, uh, facing the United States during the successful 1921 transatlantic tests. And this antenna heard signals from North America very, very strongly. And, and uh, uh, Godley wrote a series of articles in QST magazine, and I know uh, similar articles were published uh, in England uh, during the period immediately following the transatlantic tests. And they described this, the, the strengths of the signals as uh, uh, with the re receiver feeding a speaker, you could easily hear the signals from North America from uh, quite a distance from the tent. So to give you an idea, it's just, just how strong these signals were. Um, so uh, let's switch the conversation now to instead of uh, long wire antennas to uh, short vertical antennas. Uh, these have become very popular on the 160 meter band. There are two types of uh, short verticals that are commonly used for receiving antennas. One uses an active amplifier at the base of the vertical. Uh, the advantage of, of uh, this configuration is that the receiving antenna can be used on multiple bands. It's not a resonant antenna, and it can be used on 160, 80, and 40 meters. It also requires no radials, but it does require a high input impedance amplifier at the base of the vertical. And if you have an array of these high impedance verticals, these are sometimes referred to as high Z verticals, uh, they require a high impedance amplifier at the base of each vertical in the array. An alternative is to use passive uh, low impedance verticals. Their height is about the same, 20 or 25 feet, but they are resonant antennas and they're strictly for monoband operation. There is a benefit to this. Uh, if it's a monoband antenna you're going to use, and that is the antenna is very, very simple. There's no need for a preamplification at the uh, base of the vertical. Uh, they're very easy to troubleshoot and repair. The parts count is very low and they're very reliable. But they do require radials at the base of each vertical. Uh, the purpose of the radials is to stabilize the feed point impedance during all weather conditions, dry or wet. And they also help to decouple the coaxial cable shield uh, from the antenna. Uh, almost all implementations of these passive low impedance verticals use 
some uh, umbrella wires suspended from the top of the antenna. I'll show an image of that in just a, just a bit. So these are kind of the two fundamental types of antennas, and they both have their positives and negatives. Um, so this is a little bit more detail on the eight-foot diameter magnetic loop. From this point on in the presentation, we'll be talking about each of these antennas in considerably more detail. I think I've already mentioned uh, all of these aspects on this slide, so I won't read it all again. But I will re-emphasize, this is a very low output, very low signal output antenna. So it's important to have a to use a preamp with these antennas and also to suppress undesired signals received by the outside of the coaxial feed line. And the best practice for a permanent installation of one of these small loops is to bury the feed line rather than uh, definitely not to run it uh, suspended in the air because you'll wind up receiving antennas off the outside of the feed line, receiving signals off the outside of the feed line rather than off of the uh, antenna. All of these uh, receiving antennas, all of them, not just loops, but all of them are subject to re-radiated re -radiated signals from nearby antennas and towers and from power lines. Um, of course, there's not much you could do about the radiation from power lines, except to try to keep the antenna away from them. Uh, and if you have a transmitting uh, vertical or other antenna nearby, in, in many cases, if it's very close to the receiving antenna, uh, it may be desirable to disconnect that uh, vertical antenna from, from its uh, feed line, the transmitting vertical, to disconnect it using a relay to help uh, the problem of re-radiated signals from the transmitting antenna. So this is a an image of a typical small uh, diameter loop. This is an eight foot diameter loop. Uh, there's a website uh, where there's a little more detail on this. There's a compromise in terms of size of loop antennas. Uh, this antenna is about as small as you can use to have reasonable sensitivity on 160 meters. There's a trade-off between sensitivity of the antenna and the depth of the null off of the nulls off the side. There's a null on each side. So you uh, remember recalling that the main purpose of this, this antenna is to suppress a single RFI source. So you point the side of the antenna at the RFI source, and then other than that two-degree null, the antenna is basically omnidirectional. These antennas uh, can be made a, a, about as big as 17 foot diameter before the null starts to degrade. With a 17 foot diameter loop, the null depth is about 20 dB. And as you make the antenna smaller and smaller, the null depth improves, but also the sensitivity uh, of the antenna uh, degrades. So a good compromise with about 24 dB null depth is this eight foot diameter loop shown in the image. Um, and I will show uh, photographs of some of these uh, antennas in uh, just a moment. I think I've covered all of these points on this slide already. Uh, the necessity of a high gain, low noise preamp for all of these small loops. So this is an image of a very popular antenna. This, this is a, a K9A wind loop array. It's actually two loops that operate independently. So you select one loop or the other. It's uh, quite compact, uh, requires a 25 foot by 25 foot square and about 25 feet high and provides reasonably good performance for a very small antenna. Um, you do need a good quality preamp uh, with this antenna. This is a, another very, very popular antenna. It's the Array Solutions Shared Apex Loop Array. It's uh, somewhat larger uh, than the K9AY and provides somewhat better performance. Uh, its, its main performance improvement is that its beam width off the uh, uh, main, uh, main lobe of the antenna is only 75 degrees in the 3dB beam width as opposed to 120 degree beam width with the K9AY loop. So, uh, 
if you have some interference coming from the sides or or uh, someone off the front, this antenna provides somewhat better directivity in a fairly compact space. It also requires a very good preamp. This is a rotating pair of uh, vertically polarized loops. And uh, it's uh, about the size of a large tri-band Yagi. It's about uh, uh, 30 feet long. And uh, it, some of these have been, been made so they're about 50 feet long. And what, it, what they are is a pair of very close spaced loops. And this requires very, very high gain receiving preamplifiers, 30 to 40 dB with very low noise figure. There's another configuration of this antenna, horizontally polarized. It has the same problems with very low output. But if you make this antenna horizontally polarized, it has some advantages in terms of immunity from RFI. But the problem is that in order to get uh, any kind of useful performance from a horizontal version of this antenna, it has to be at least 100 feet high, but much higher is much better. So the, there's only a few of these horizontal versions of this antenna that have ever been built, but the hams lucky enough to have them are, are having very good success with them. So these, these antennas are not new. Um, they, some of the uh, beverage antenna was developed during the World War One, and uh, it was uh, patented in 1921. It's just simply a wire terminated by a resistor uh, shown here on the right-hand side and uh, a means of coupling into what then was called receiving apparatus. It's just a matching transformer. That was 1920 is when the application was submitted. This is a, a very useful uh, chart that shows the uh, performance of uh, beverage antennas of various lengths. And uh, shown in red is the front to back ratio versus length. And shown in green, you can see how the, the uh, gain of the antenna improves. But notice on the right hand side, the gain is shown as negative figures. So these antennas have some loss, nowhere near as much loss as the small loops. But you can see that uh, as you lengthen the antenna, you get more and more received uh, performance out of them. And in the blue line, this is that WHJI metric called receiving directivity factor. And you can see that it improves. Uh, it's shown on the extreme left side, RDF, and measured in dB, and it, it improves with the increasing length. Um, there's a very good article about uh, beverage and bog performance that's available on the web, and the URL is shown at the bottom of this chart. Of course, you knew one thing about this uh, front to back ratio uh, uh, line that's sh uh, shown here in red. Uh, you know, it shows a quite extreme variation in front to back, but uh, this is a literal meaning of the term front to back. So it's literally exactly off the front of the antenna compared to exactly the back of the antenna. And what's actually happening here is when the front to back ratio degrades, as it does at a length of 450 feet, the nulls are still there but the nulls are no longer directly at the back of the beverage antenna, they're off somewhat to the side. Um, so there really is no magic to the length of these. A lot of, uh, probably most beverage antennas that are used on 160 meters or around 500 to 600 feet long. And this is why, because of the front to back ratio, but quite honestly, uh, the, the actual, uh, performance from these antennas is not very sensitive to length at all. Um, the front to back ratio gradually improves with length. And the uh, uh, if you're not exactly at the optimum uh, length for front to back, the nulls are still there, but they're just somewhat off of the exact rear of the antenna. This is a photograph of a beverage on ground that is permanently elevated uh, 
several inches above the grass. Of course, the obvious problem with an antenna like this is how do you avoid a, an extremely severe tripping hazard? And I have uh, no idea how you do that. I was involved uh, with the installation of some very large beverage arrays uh, in my professional career. And they were not very tall. They were about four feet high. Uh, and the way we solved that problem uh, was to put a fence around the entire array. Um, but for, for, for an antenna like this, it's probably not practical to put a, a fence around this array. So I have no idea how you protect from uh, injuring someone with an antenna like this. But its performance is quite good, um, much better than if the wire were laying on the ground or even right on the surface of the grass. So let's go back in history a little bit. This is a patent that was uh, filed in 1921, and this shows a bidirectional beverage antenna uh, fed from, from one end, but that can, where the directivity can be reversed. Um, and you could purchase these antennas to this day. And there's a URL shown at the bottom here uh, with, that, that describes these uh, bidirectional beverage antennas in more detail. This is a radiation pattern of a typical 600-foot beverage antenna. Uh, a 500-foot one would be about the same. And this is a three-dimensional uh, plot. And you can see the beverage antenna has a very broad main lobe uh, off the front. It also has uh, uh, a, a lobe that comes directly from overhead. Not of very much importance because not that many interfering signals come from directly overhead. And it has a smaller lobe off the back. So this is a three-dimensional image of the performance of a, of a typical beverage antenna. And uh, this is an array of staggered beverages for the 160 meter band, normally the two beverage antennas are, are spaced side by side about 30 feet and staggered so that one antenna is uh, slightly in front of the other, staggered about 120 feet. And this can be done either with uh, full size beverages, 500 to 600 feet long, or it can be done with uh, beverages on ground as well, but the uh, RDF is nowhere near as good as it is for uh, the normal beverages uh, seven feet above the ground. And this is a massive antenna. Uh, this particular antenna was developed for the transatlantic radio telephone circuit that was uh, operational starting in 1928. It was a single channel system using high power transmitter in uh, on Long Island, New York, and another high power transmitter, uh, uh, which was located uh, just off of what is now the M1, north of London, uh, at Rugby. And the receiving antennas uh, were located in very low noise locations. Uh, on the American side, it was located in very far northern Maine, uh, not far from the Atlantic Ocean. And on the uh, UK side, the receiving antenna was located in Scotland. And uh, these antennas uh, for the implementations we do today for HF, and I only know of one system like this that's, that's in use by HIMSS, but there are probably a few more. They typically use 800 foot beverages with 350 foot broadside spacing and achieve about the same beam width as a five element Yagi. So let's look at some of these short vertical antennas. For uh, if you remember, the high impedance antennas have a high impedance preamplifier at the base of each vertical. Uh, the benefit of these antennas primarily being no radials and multi band operation. Uh, you can build a phased array antenna, or you can buy them ready to install that operate uh, quite well on the 160, 80, and 40 meter uh, hand bands. Uh, because of the high impedance of these verticals, if you're using them in, them in a phased array, uh, you really would like to have those verticals as nearly identical in terms of their surroundings as possible. 
Otherwise, the feed point impedance of the antennas can, and the signal output level from the antennas can vary somewhat, uh, affecting the performance of the array. So normally, it's recommended that these high Z verticals used in an array uh, be installed not closer than about 10 feet from nearby objects. So they shouldn't be very close to trees or any other conductive or partially conductive structure. Such, per, such as perhaps a, a barn with wiring inside. Uh, and of course, uh, like any receiving antenna, you want to keep it away from nearby antennas and power lines uh, to avoid re-radiation. And this is a the same type of image that I showed for the beverage antennas. But you can see for an array of two of these 20-foot uh, uh, verticals uh, spaced only about 80 feet apart, uh, they have a very, very broad lobe off the front and a very deep null off the back. Um, these are quite useful antennas. Uh, if you have uh, 80 feet of space available, the main problem being uh, very often hams that only have room for uh, two verticals 80 feet apart, often they have to be placed very close to their transmitting antenna. And then you have to do something about preventing re-radiation from the transmitting antenna, which can spoil the performance of the receiving antenna. This is uh, an image uh, taken by OZ1RDP of his array of four high impedance verticals. This is a very high performing antenna, probably one of the most popular receiving antennas used on the 160 meter band. Um, they don't take that much space about uh, a square uh, 80 feet on a side, and the individual verticals are about 20 feet high. So this is a very popular antenna. Beam width is uh, usefully narrow, about 100 degrees uh, beam width off the front of the vertical. And this is, is uh, another uh, image uh, showing the three-dimensional three pattern of the radiation off of the four-square array of 20-foot verticals. That's quite an excellent antenna. Uh, for those who have uh, more space, this is an image of an eight element array of high impedance verticals, 20 foot verticals. But this requires uh, about three quarters of an acre. Um, and if you use a high impedance version of the of, uh, verticals, you don't need any radials or umbrella wires, but you do need a high impedance preamplifier at the base of every vertical. So you require eight uh, preamplifiers. I'll just mention as an aside, um, the uh, preamplifiers on these antennas are very subject to damage from lightning strikes. So it's common for hams who use these kind of antennas with a big investment in preamplifiers uh, during the summer season or during any part of the year when lightning is a serious threat. A lot of the owners of these antennas have uh, installed their preamps in such a way that they can be conveniently removed and stored uh, during the part of the year when they're not actively using the antenna. And this is a, another image of this antenna showing uh, its, uh, its performance. There's a very excellent antenna that was developed by the Yankee Clipper Contest Club, YCCC. Uh, the, there's a detailed description of uh, how to construct uh, this antenna. The URL is shown at the bottom of this slide. I'll make these slides available to David at the end so they can be distributed, or you can send me an email and I can provide a set of uh, a copy of these slides uh, as well. My uh, Email address has not changed in 30 years. So if you go to uh, qrz.com and look up my call sign W3LPL, you can find my email address and I'll be happy to send you a copy of these uh, slides as a PDF attached to an email. So the YCCC array can be built in a number of configurations. It can be built as a simple inline array of three verticals or it can be built uh, with five verticals or with nine verticals. Uh, it uses high impedance uh, amplifiers, so there's a high impedance amp at the feed point of each vertical. 
Um, similarly, these uh, antennas can be built using monoband. They, they can be built using monoband uh, uh, low impedance verticals, uh, 25 feet high. Uh, and it's a very excellent choice for the uh, eight, eight element array because you, you avoid the need for preamplifiers. Uh, this is the same image of OZ1 RDP's uh, four element array, just emphasizing that it can also be used with uh, low impedance verticals rather than the verticals that require a preamp for each antenna. This is a, a, a photograph of the low impedance verticals I use at my station. Uh, see, so uh, just following the little arrows uh, pointing at the uh, image. The verticals are 25 feet tall. There are four umbrella wires, and you can see them uh, uh, in the in the photograph. There's a short piece of rope that uh, ties the end of the umbrella wire to a seven foot fence post. And the foundation for this antenna is very simple. It's just a, a short length of uh, rebar uh, in the ground. The construction details for this antenna are shown at the URL below, uh, www.w5zn.org. And this is uh, the same three-dimensional image showing the actual directivity of, of uh, the antenna that I use, which is a 350-foot diameter uh, version of the antenna, and uh, it's described on that W5ZN uh, website. So this requires about four acres of land for this implementation. And uh, this is a schematic diagram showing the receiving antennas I use at my station. Uh, this These antennas are installed temporarily uh, from October through March each year. I have a neighbor who allows me to use his field uh, 1,200 feet from my transmitting antennas. So the black dots show the eight 160 meter, 25 foot high umbrella verticals with no preamps. And then concentric to those eight verticals is a set of verticals for two and for the 80 meter band. And then crossing through the center of this array is three beverage antennas about 550 feet long. So this this entire array takes uh, the the verticals take about four acres and the beverages uh, consume I guess about eight acres in total. So uh, getting to the end of the presentation, uh, this uh, phasing system can be purchased from DX Engineering. It's uh, fairly expensive, but it's a very high performance phasing system for uh, two antennas. And, and its primary benefit being that you can create a very deep null from two antennas, but for, for, the, for it to perform well, the antenna should be fairly widely separated. And this is the last image in the slide. The Elecraft K3 uh, introduced, I guess, uh, 15 or 20 years ago now, uh, has a pair of phase locked receivers uh, if you purchase the second receiver option. And the benefit to that is that using two widely spaced 160 meter antennas, about 500 foot spacing, uh, the diversity effect is quite pronounced. Uh, the way you do this is you listen to one receiver in your left ear and to the other receiver in your right ear. And uh, it's quite remarkable to hear the independent fading that happens uh, between a pair of widely spaced receivers. So David, that's the end of my presentation. I think I took up my allotted uh, 45 minutes and uh, I'll be happy to ask it, to reply to any questions either in person here or uh, uh, by email. And uh, and as I mentioned, my email address is on qrz.com. So go ahead, David. Many thanks, Frank. I'll let you get a well and um, breather and a, a drink maybe. So thanks for that. Um, <clears throat> We've already had a, a comment which, which echoed something that was in my mind. Um, Martin G7UGB says, I think I need to get a bigger garden. <laughs> They're beginning to think the same. And I've got, I'm, I'm lucky to have a reasonably sized garden. I mean, the last antenna you mentioned, you needed eight acres, I think you said, didn't you? 
Yeah, uh, that, for this one, this is my array. So, so rather than purchasing more land, and land is very expensive here as it is in England. So I borrow a neighbor's field. <laughs> he doesn't he uh, doesn't use it during the winter, so I borrow it. So that's how I solve that problem. Yeah, well, that is some that is some antenna system. I mean, of all of the other aerials and things that you've talked about, though. What what's for the everyman, shall we say? Um, you know, is there one favourite, one that you've got? And by the way, I should mention to everybody, as you've mentioned anyway, please do ask your questions and make any comments for Frank. We've already got a couple for you, but uh, we'd love to hear from everybody else as well. So what's your favourite, Frank? Well, of course, my favourite is the one I've built, right? So, that's, so it's that okay. one that requires about eight acres. But what about um, for the everyman then? <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, so it's like so many so many things, David. You you start with trying to understand the problem you're trying to solve. You know these these antennas are not antennas looking for a problem. Usually they're a problem looking for a solution. So so if you if the problem you're trying to deal with is RFI from a, a neighboring home, then a, a small loop antenna uh, can be a good solution to that. Uh, they have very deep nulls, but unfortunately. Uh, it can really only null one interfering source at a time. So that's the disadvantage of the small antenna. They have just one null. So, uh, and I showed you a variety of antennas that, that could be deployed. And then uh, I'll just... Uh, this is one of the most popular relatively compact antenna so it's 80 feet by 80 feet and 20 feet high um, and if you don't have room for four of these then you can use two of them in line with 80 foot spacing so this is a this is an excellent solution that's widely widely used uh, and 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 uh, if if that's uh, a problem then uh, uh, a very popular solution is either the K9AY, which requires 20 feet, 25 feet by 25 feet. Mm. A lot of people can accommodate that. Or uh, somewhat better performance requires 50 feet by 50 feet. So that's kind of where we stand. Yeah. I think through all of your talking tonight and all of the things you've talked about, it's mainly your emphasis is, it seems to be on receive antennas antennas for receiving i guess that's the bit that needs to be so precise and selective yeah well that's that's a that could be a big challenge on on 160 meters is receiving transmitting is really pretty simple uh on 160 meters for transmitting you you really really want to use a vertically polarized antenna their performance is much better than horizontal polarized antennas um and by far the most popular version of a vertical antenna for 160 is the inverted L, where you, you put the vertical part as tall as you can, it can be as little as 25 or 30 feet, but higher is better. And then the remainder of the quarter wavelength wire, 125 feet, is uh, run horizontal parallel to the ground. And it doesn't have to be in a straight line. Yeah. Okay, so I've got a question here from Roger, G3LDI. Hi Frank, I mangled my K9AY loop with the lawnmower and will be resurrecting it. However, I cannot bury the feed to get it to the shack. Any idea how much that will affect the performance? Yeah, uh, well, you, what you need to do is to be absolutely sure that uh, you've isolated signals from the outside of the shield of the coaxial cable from the feed point of the antenna. So uh, lacking the, uh, the ability to bury the, the cable, the next best choice is to lay it directly on the ground. Um, and the worst possible choice is to run it above the ground uh, where it's very exposed to interfering signals. So I would suggest you lay it on the ground if you can, but in, in either case, either laying on the ground or elevated, what you need to do is use uh, ferrites to uh, uh, provide uh, common mode isolation. And if, if you don't know where to look for that, you can send me an email and I can point you in some of the, some places uh, that discuss common mode chokes.
But if you look, if you just use Google and search for the term common mode chokes, chokes, you'll probably find the same references that I would point you to. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Frank, on behalf of Roger. And by the way, he adds a note at the end. Uh, by the way, sad to lose Jack and Fred, who were friends from decades ago. Yeah, that was uh, very sad. Yep. Um, and, we, and, and another very well-known uh, uh, radio amateur, K7JA, Chip, just passed away recently too. Sorry. Sorry to hear that. Um, you mentioned during your talk about your career and you, when you were looking at different beverages and things. So can I just ask you what your career was? I was a system engineer. Uh, I, start, I, I uh, started as an electronics engineer, but uh, as often happens uh, with some of us with a lot of curiosity, we discover that electronic solutions are only one part of a much bigger picture. So uh, much of my career was uh, systems engineering, which was deeply involved in trying to understand customers and their environment, their limitations, uh, the depth of the problems they try to solve, and then trying to match technical solutions to the delivery of the kind of uh, results they need. So much of my, my career was in uh, systems engineering, mostly in the military. Right. Okay. So explains your wide experience then. Uh, got a question now from Paul Gunther. Um, if you have a large area of ground available, I would have thought a rhombic antenna would be a better choice of antenna, but please correct him if he's wrong. That's Paul. Uh, that's very wrong uh, for the 160 meter band. Um, and, and if you notice, there are very, very few rhombic antennas in use anymore. They were developed during the 1930s when uh, transatlantic, well, worldwide uh, telephone was done by HF radio. And uh, they took enormous amounts of land uh, in order to provide more than one direction. A, a typical rhombic array for the HF bands that was uh, used uh, by very few hands, but mostly by the military and uh, uh, radio telephone. One of those antennas was typically about 500 feet long, absolute minimum, and typically 70 feet tall or higher. And then if you needed to cover many directions, suddenly you found out that you needed uh, a square mile of space. And there were quite a few places in the UK uh, where there were these huge arrays of rhombic antennas with uh, one square mile or more uh, for these antennas. But it was quickly discovered that uh, maintaining such huge antennas was a massive investment. Uh, you had to have uh, on-site uh, tower climbers and uh, uh, technical people to maintain such an enormous amount of wire. So they fell into disuse when broadband antennas like log periodics were uh, developed that took much less space and took uh, made similar performance. So you, you won't find many rhombic antennas in use today. But let me now focus on the 160 meter band. On the 160 meter band, wavelengths are very large. So in order to get, typically a rhombic antenna is installed at least one wavelength high. So on the 20 meter band, that's not too bad. That's 70 feet high minimum. On the 160 meter band, on the other hand, one wavelength is almost 600 feet. So it's not very practical to install rhombic antennas 600 feet high. I would suggest that it's never been done, nor should it be. Uh, because on the 160 meter band, uh, the simple kind of antennas that I've showed actually perform, provide better performance than a rhombic antenna, and they only need to be 20 feet high. So uh, rhombic antennas are totally impractical on the low bands, and the antennas I showed are far better performance. Yeah, in your career as a system engineer, I presume as well as antennas, you, you're quite familiar with the electronics involved as well. I'm just wondering that with the today's modern electronics, incredibly low noise transistors, you know, FETs and things like that, really very, very sensitive. 
Do they, for receive antennas, do they to some extent replace the need for some of the big, large antennas because you can get so much gain from the electronics that you can put in the preamp? Well, in fact, that, that's what makes these small antennas practical. Um, the, the preamps for these high impedance verticals that I showed or for the very, these very small loops for those small signal levels. So, so it, it is the, the uh, uh, modern low noise uh, transistors uh, that make a lot of this uh, uh, very practical. There have been uh, other solutions going back many years, all the way back to the 1920s. Uh, I showed a schematic of one of, one of those uh, amplifiers that was used back in the 1920s. But that was done uh, professionally. But the big difference is now that the ready avail availability of low noise uh, transistors makes it very practical for him to build uh, pre-amplifiers. You don't have to purchase them. They're easy to build. They've been documented in uh, various amateur magazines over the years. So yeah, it's, it's made things a whole lot more practical and a whole lot less expensive. Yeah, sure. Well, it's good. It's fascinating. It's, as always, it's lovely to meet you again, Frank. And um, by the way, we I, I shouldn't tell you too much here. I'll let Roger tell you himself, but he has had a rhombic up, but it's not up at the moment. And suffice to say, there's a little bit of chatter going on on the uh, on the British Amateur Television Club, where we stream this too as well, between people saying, please, no, you're not going to want to put that up again. He says he is. <laughs> I'll get him to talk to you first. All right, Frank? <laughs> yep. I, I, uh, I've i never thought about putting Robics up here. I've got uh, arrays of Yagi antennas, and I would hate to think what it would take uh, <laughs> to duplicate that with an array of Robics. I've, I've, I've visited and used some of the antennas uh, from some of these uh, sites that had square miles of rhombic arrays. Some of those sites that I visited were in the UK. And uh, I just can't imagine anyone ever investing that much uh, investment in land and towers. Uh, one, of, one of the sites I worked at in the UK that, that had these rhombic arrays it had, uh, they were supported by steel towers that were anywhere from 70 to 150 feet high. And there were probably a, more than a hundred of these towers on that site. Uh, they're long gone though. Uh, and if anybody who's, dri who's driven up the M1 years ago when uh, the rugby station was there, yeah, that's what these sites looked like. It was, yeah. they were incredible. Well, that's pretty much Rogers, but I better not mention any more. I'll be in trouble. What has he said? Oh, yes. Well, um, yeah. So as, as Sonny's just said, it was his uh, Rogers Rhombic is for 20 meters. Um, uh, anyway, I'm not going to bet not say any more. I'll let them talk to you. And maybe, as I said, if he does talk about putting it up again, I'm definitely going to get him to talk to you first. Frank, it's been lovely to see you again. And thank you very much for tonight's presentation. You're very welcome. All the best. Thank you. 73. 73. There we are. That's uh, Frank. W3 LPL, lovely to see him again. We saw him, I think, the first time you know, fairly early on when we started doing NARC Live. Great to see him again. So thanks to him and thanks for all of you for joining us tonight. And uh, for those of you, by the way, who did send us photos and videos and things, thank you very much indeed for covering uh, Radioactive. That's about it for this week. Just to cover what's going on at the club this week, we've got on Sunday the uh, GB2RS News on GB3MB at 7 o'clock. On Monday at 7.30, also on GB3MB, we've got the Monday Night Net. At 8 o'clock, the 80 meter CW Net on 3.543 megahertz. And then a week today, Wednesday, June the 14th, we're meeting at the CNS School for a social and bright sparks for our young members. And we'll be back here again in two weeks' time with a talk from Lauren KE0HZ on HamPi and other ham applications for single board computers. So we look forward to that. But until then... From Tammy M0TC. <clears throat> bye bye. No sign of that Dalek, is there? No. And from me, David G7URP. Take care of yourselves. Look after each other. Bye bye.